David, have you looked at homework three? Uh, okay. Uh, some people have looked at it, and some people pointed out some typos. Actually, not only one typo, not some typos, which I fixed yesterday. Hopefully, there are no more typos. I think it's easier. I really think it's easier than homework two. David, you think it's a surprise? A lot of are a little bit involved. Uh. But I tell you something. If you can do the last two and you understand it properly, there is a similar question on the final. So the purpose of putting in those questions is for you to acclimatize to the sort of questions that will come out in the final. Yeah? Talk more about the quiz on Thursdays, uh, during Thursday's lecture. Some joining us. Good. So it's possible to give an answer. Also, oh, people are uh, here. Can the people in Zoom hear me? Hello. Okay, great. Samuel, did you email me? Samuel, do you email me? 
Were you the one? Huh? You mean there are two? Wait, someone just... Yeah, Samuel Ku just emailed me. There are two Samuels here. All right, so... Right, I will reply to your email at around six o'clock. After this lecture, I'm going running. Okay, great. So thank you very much for showing up. Can I start? I will talk more about the logistics of the quiz uh, on Thursday's lecture. But today, let us continue our discussion of continuous random variables. I looked at the syllabus again, and I removed some optional topics because I think that we don't have to cover so much. Uh, in chapter four. So I decided to cover less and I decided to do more examples, which will help your understanding. Okay. So uh, let us continue where we left off last time, which is joint PDF of random variables. So let me uh, go through some basics to, re to uh, help you to recap. Right. So we have two random variables, X and Y. Both of these are continuous random variables. And um, we say that, okay, hang on. F, X, Y, we write it as, as follow, is the probability density function, probability density function or PDF of uh, the pair X, Y, okay? So what does the probability density function, what are the properties that the probability density function has to satisfy? The most important one is the following. Okay, X and Y is a pair of random variables. What is the probability that it lands in a subset B? Here B is a subset of the plane R squared. Okay, I will provide some examples shortly because there's the notation here is a bit heavy. So we here we integrate over B of the probability density function. Okay in order to get the probability that x, y belongs to b. For example, if b, if the set b is the set of all x, y pairs in R2, such that x is between a and b, and y is between c and d, all right? Inclusive of exclusive does not really matter. Then the probability of b, of sorry, x, y belonging to b, is equal to the probability that uh, x is between a and little b, and y is between c and little d. And that can be written as the integral from, maybe I will do c to d, a to b, of the probability density function integrated accordingly. Okay? So that is the basic property. Uh, so that is the, the probability density function, or more precisely, the joint PDF, joint probability density function. So a very special case that we discussed last time is the following. If um, we have that the pair of random variables X, Y is uniform on a set S subset of R squared, which is a set of all uh, pairs of real numbers, then F, X, Y, X, Y is equal to Two cases, one over the area of S when X, Y belongs to S and zero otherwise. Okay. Now, uh, we can also find the probability that X, Y belongs to a set A, where A is a subset of S. That is nothing but the area of A divided by the area of S. Okay, and this is easy to see because that is nothing but the integral over A of the joint density. The joint density is a short form for joint probability density function. But this probability density function, since A is a subset of S, that is nothing but one over, using the formula above, area of S, dx dy. Here we are integrating over A. So, since this is just a constant, the integrand here is a constant. It can be brought outside. And so we have the area of A over the area of S. Okay, so this is some basic stuff that we talked about last time, just to jolt your memory. Okay, so 
I wanted to continue our example from last time. So I will just copy this, okay? And remind you of a few facts. So here we are not uh, going to do any new example. We're just going to continue with this particular example from last time, okay? So hopefully you can see this. Let me paste it here. Okay, so here we have that the joint PDF of XY is a constant C on the set S as specified below. All right, so this is a strange set, but the point here is that the PDF of XY is constant, is flat on the set S specified below. Now, uh, one thing that I didn't say today, but I said it many times before, is that if you have the joint, you can get the marginals by marginalization. So if I'm interested in Fy, the marginal on Y, I can just integrate out X from minus infinity to infinity. So that is one way to get, that is the only way that we can get the marginal on Y, integrate out. And this operation is called marginalization. Okay. This operation is called marginalization. So at this point, uh, last week we obtained, last week we did this problem halfway. We saw that C is equal to one quarter. And the reason is that the area of S is equal to four. I think it's easy to see. Look at this rectangle here, the area is three. And this rectangle here, the area is one. So the, the total area is four. And by the formula above, and by the normalization property that the integral of the probability density function must be equal to one. So C must be one quarter. The height above the plane must be one quarter for the yellow part, okay? So hopefully that is clear. This is from last week. Last week, we also computed, we also computed the marginal on x, fx, x. And we did that by looking at this particular formula, integrating out y. We basically integrate out what we don't want to get what we want. Okay, so that is a simple formula. Last week, we applied this. So now I want to go through the mechanics of trying to find the marginal on y, fy. So that is the PDF of y. Okay, from just from the picture. Okay, so that is what we will do from now. And we will spend five minutes uh, to do this slowly. Okay, is everyone with me? Any questions? They, those, those two were the, what we did last time and I will not belabor the point because you have the notes from last time. I also take this question from the book. So we are all good. Uh, any questions from the people in Zoom? Any questions? Sorry, I need to call on some people. Okay, right. So um, let us try to find the PDF of Y. And of course the formula to do that is via this, is this, okay? So let's do this slowly. Okay, you need to understand this procedure. So let me do it slowly for you. Okay, so now before we find a PMF or the PDF of anything, we have to ask ourselves the question, what is the support? Where is the PMF or the PDF non-zero? Where is it positive? So now, if you look from this direction, you're looking at the Y's, okay? Look from here. Now, if you look here, do you see any mass of Y? No, you don't. You're not crossing any mass at all. So if Y is in this area here from zero to one, you have no mass. And if Y is bigger than four, you again, you look at this direction, this is the direction you look at. There is no mass, no mass at all. So if Y is smaller than one and bigger than four, there is no mass. And so pro the probability density function of Y is exactly zero here and there. Okay, is that clear? So there's only some action here. All right, there's only some action from one to four. So it suffices for us to focus on the region from one to four inclusive. So that is one, two, three, and four. There is something here. All right. Everyone understand? There's some, some stuff happening there. 
Of course, it is not of this shape, but uh, outside this area, you have zero density. Is that clear? The red one, okay, you have zero density. So there is some stuff happening here. So let's try to figure that out, okay? So now let us now look at any Y that is between one and two, okay? Look at any Y between one and two. So Fy of Y is equal to, let us apply the formula from minus infinity to infinity Fxy, Xy dx. Okay, so now do we have to go from minus infinity to infinity, all right? So now we are looking at this particular slice somewhere here. We're looking at this particular slice. Now, do, does our x have to go from minus infinity to infinity? No, our x only has to go from this point to that point. Can you see that? Uh, David, can you see only those two red dots there? Yeah, okay. So this integral can thus be reduced to going from one to two. And what is the f of x, y in this region? What is the value? It is exactly one quarter our c. All right, it is this, All right? So we are just using this information and doing this integration. But this integration is fairly straightforward because the, the, the width here, the width is one, and this is a constant. So that is exactly one quarter. Understand? So in this particular region here, from one to two, our height here is a quarter. Understand? integrating from this point to that point only. And so our FYY calculation is this. Now, assuming you understand this, the next thing to look at is basically a Y that is between two and three here. Then our integration point is from here to there, the width of our integration. And so we can perform this calculation again. Okay, so I just have to change some numbers here from two to three. And here, I just have to change the numbers here in this region from two to three. Then I get the integral. Okay, now when I go from two to three, okay, well, my Y is somewhere here. My X is integrated from this left end point to this right end point, which is from one to three. Okay, one to three here. Got it? And so now this becomes what? This becomes uh, one half, two over four. Does that make sense? Uh, Samuel, does that make sense? Is this clear? You need to know how to do this. Unfortunately, the picture is, I need to scroll up. Any, I'm uh, still processing. Okay, now let me repeat. This is really important. Suppose I fix a y from two to three is here. I want to apply this particular formula. Okay, sorry. I want to apply this particular formula because I want to find the density of y. If y is from two to three, I need to integrate over all possible values x from minus infinity to infinity. But when x is in this region here and that region there, the value of the density is exactly zero. It is only positive from here to there. And what's the meaning from here to there? It is from one to three. And so my integration range is from one to three here. Can you see? And the value of the density is one quarter and it gives one half. Samuel, are you processing still? Okay. okay, so there's one final region and then, okay, so let me draw this. So now you're at one half here, okay? In this region, you're at one half. Can you see one half? Okay, so we have one more region to, one more region from three to four to handle, okay? Now from three to four, let us put a calculation here. Now from three to four, what I'm looking at is this particular slice, okay? Now, most of this slice is zero, except from when the red line intersects with the region. 
and the red line intersects in the, with the region when x is between 1 and 2. So this integral here goes from 1 to 2. This is from 3 to 4. I know this may, be a, may, may sound a bit confusing. Let me reassure you that the first time I learned this, it was also very confusing to me. Okay, you are not alone. But you somehow you need to know this, all right? So this is flat here, and it goes down here. Okay, and folks, so we have done our very best to find the density here, and we are very happy with our beautiful picture. But is there something we need to check after we are done with this? Okay, so this is a marginal density that we have derived. Good for us. Is there something we need to check? Uh, okay, the, yes, uh, yes, uh, Sean, indeed. Uh, David, should the marginal P... Uh, actually, David, you should say the marginal... Yeah. We are dealing with continuous random variables, okay? So we need to check whether this red thing here integrates to one. Okay, so we can check indeed that this little square here has area one quarter, this has area one half, and this has area one quarter, which adds up to one, and we're happy. Is this clear? So we are good. So here I found the marginal PDF of Y for you. But uh, is there a faster way to do all this? There is, okay, but uh, I, you, you, can, you, you can just look at this picture here. This is the joint density here, all right? You see that if you look in this direction here, when y is between two to three, you are sweeping out a mass, you are sweeping out a region that is twice as long. So this part here must be twice as tall as the left part and the right part. So that's just my observation, all right? That's how I would do it, but for beginners, I walk you through the steps slowly, slowly, All right? Slowly, as you can see, these three different calculations here. Is that clear? So this calculation are the different regions, region one, region two, and region three. This is region one, region two, and region three here. Is that clear? Any questions? Uh, David, any questions? Did I answer your question? Okay. Right. Now, this is a sort of simple question that will come out that is a certainly fair game for the exam, right? Fair game for the assessments. Okay, we have a question here. Sorry, why are we looking at the area or is there volume involved? Now, when we look at a one-dimensional probability density function like this, we are looking at the area under the graph. When we are looking at two-dimensional probability density function, we are looking at the volume under the region. Samuel, is that clear? So last time I drew, last time I drew this particular beautiful picture here, you need to look at the volume under this surface here, and you check that the volume under this surface is of volume one. All right, because this is a two-dimensional PDF. Now, when you're talking about a simpler case, like a one-dimensional PDF, you're looking at the area underneath here. Samuel, is that clear? Do you think Samuel is clear? Okay, great. Right. And so this is a simple question that is certainly fair game for the exam. But the next question, the next example that I'm going to do is too difficult. All right. But nevertheless, it is a very classical thing that uh, one should cover in a probability class, and that is Buffon's needle, right? This sort of thing is like the uh, Olympiad type of question, right? But, but it is certainly, it's, it, it's certainly uh, doable by you, right? With a little bit of guidance. So we have these horizontal lines, all right? These horizontal lines are distance D apart, okay? All of them are distance D apart. Now, Someone is going to come here and someone is going to throw a needle of length L less than D on this plane here. Someone is going to throw a needle. Okay, so the needle of a certain length, so say it is this of this length, 
this of length L. So this needle here does not, the way I've drawn this needle now of length L, maybe so shorter, does not cross any of the two lines, does not cross any line at all. But you could throw the needle uniformly at on this plane here, such that it happens that it crosses this line here. Can you see? So sometimes it crosses the one of the lines, sometimes it does not cross any of the lines. And because L is less than D, right? It cannot cross two lines. So it cannot be like this. This is too long. Okay. So we want to try to understand in this uh, question here, in this problem, what is the probability that if I throw a needle in any arbitrary way, anyway, it crosses a line. And this procedure here can actually be used to estimate pi. Okay. So let me, let us go through this systematically. All right, so this particular needle does not cross the line and this particular needle here crosses, right? Okay, so we're gonna assume that the needle is of length L less than D, all right? And basically the reason for this is that this precludes a needle crossing two lines at the same time, okay? So, right. So what we are going to do is to set this up properly as uh, it, in a way that reflects that we are throwing the needle uniformly at random, okay? So we're going to let theta, theta is usually used for angle, be the acute angle uh, formed by the axis of the needle and the parallel lines. I'm going to remove these uh, artificial needles here. All right. I'm going to draw a proper needle later. Okay. And we are going to let X be the vertical distance from the midpoint of the needle to the closest parallel line. Ah, oh, shucks. To the needle to the closest parallel line. Okay, so uh, this is all a mouthful. Let me just draw a picture here. So here is our needle of length L. Okay, so where is our X and where is our theta? All right, the theta is basically this angle here, theta. Okay, so can you see this is the theta angle? And what is our X? Our X is basically the following. All right, you take the midpoint of the line here and our X is this distance here. Okay, so that's what we mean by the X and the theta. That's the, those, those are the definitions. Okay, so we are going to model this as uniformly throwing our needle, the a green needle onto the plane. And so that what it means is our probability density function of X and this is capital X and capital theta. That's why you have this strange symbol, all right? This X theta, we are gonna assume that is uniformly thrown, okay? Onto the set. So this has a, um, has a value has a value of the following that I'm going to explain, 4 over pi d, when x theta belongs to the set s and 0 otherwise. But what is this set s? This set s is a set of all possible x theta pairs such that x is between 0 and d over 2, and theta is between 0 and pi over 2, radians, okay? So, we are assuming that this X is uniformly distributed between zero and D over two, okay? So the maximum that X can be is between zero and D over two only. It cannot be any longer, okay? And this pi, this theta here is an acute angle. We are assuming that it's uniformly distributed among all angles that are between zero and 90 degrees. 90 degrees is pi over two. And this region here, has a total area of d pi over four. And so the value here is the reciprocal 
is pi a uh, four over pi d. Okay, so that is uniform over this particular strange region. Got it? Now, one more time, the x is uniformly distributed between zero here and d over two. Pi theta is uniformly distributed between zero and pi over two. This point is pi over two. Okay. So the product of these two gives the area, which is d pi over four, and hence this is four over pi d, for this to integrate to one. So that is our assumption on the throwing of the needle process. We are uniformly throwing onto the plane. So when will the needle cross the line? All right. The needle will cross a particular line, and this is the key. Needle will cross a line if and only if, if and only if x is less than L over 2 sine theta, sine theta, where this theta is the random variable theta. Okay, so why is that so? If we look at this particular picture here, maybe I will zoom out, okay? We will cross the line if, I'm zooming out first, I'm drawing this picture here. This is our angle theta, all right? And that is L over two, okay? This is our L over two, all right? This is uh, this part here. This is half length, L over two, all right? We will cross the line if X is small enough. But how small is small enough, all right? Now, this, if this is L over 2 by standard trigonometry, all right, this is L over 2 sine theta here. And this is L over 2 cosine theta, all right? So this is some trigonometry. Either you know it or you don't, but I'm not going to teach this. So if X, right, if X is less than this value, this X here is less than L over 2 sine theta, then we are going to cross the line. That's, that requires a moment of thought. All right, so the required probability is the probability that X is less than equal to L over two sine capital theta. Okay, basically we need X to be less than this value for, for us to cross the line. X must be small enough. So we can actually compute this in close form. All right, so we are integrating over the region X less than equal to uh, L over 2 sine theta of the density F x theta x theta d x d theta. All right? But this is the same as integral, let's say, integral over uh, 0 to pi over 2. We are integrating theta on the outside and we are integrating x on the inside. Okay, uh, this is some integration gymnastics that. Uh, maybe you have seen before. So this is uniform 4 over pi d, dx, d theta. So the integration over theta is on the outside. The integration over x is on the inside. I don't know how you learned this, but this is how I learned it. <laughs> so now we can perform the inner integration. The inner integration is very nice and easy because it is constant with respect to x. So all we have to do is to multiply this and that. And by multiplying this and that, what do we get? All right, we get, uh, uh, maybe I'll bring this outside first. Okay, I don't know how great you are in integration, but I'm not an expert. Okay, you have L over two sine theta here, D theta. Okay, hopefully you know how to integrate sine. All right. So we have four over pi D, L over two. The integral of sine is minus cosine. From pi over two to zero, and this thing, this whole thing is one. So we are left with four, a uh, two L over pi D. So the probability that we actually, uh, that the needle actually crosses one of the lines is exactly this, okay? So in particular, if actually L is equal to D, all right, then the probability that the needle crosses a line is actually two over pi. So if you have, so this is a way to estimate pi. 
Because if you have a bunch of lines, all right, and all of them are of length D, spaced apart, and your needle is also of length D, if you throw the needle multiple times, then, the, then you count the number of times that actually the needle crosses a line, that will give you an approximation of this number. And so you can actually take the reciprocal and multiply by two, and you can estimate pi after many, many throws. Yes, we have a question. Why did we reciprocate? Uh, yes, uh, Valencia, thank you very much. Uh, because the area of S is equal to D over two times pi over two, which is pi D over four. And as I mentioned at the beginning of this lecture, the probability density function is the reciprocal of the area assuming uniformity. Oh yes, okay, she says okay. So we are all good, all right? So this is the reciprocal of that, okay? So, you know, reciprocal means one over. So this is the key and you are integrating over this region. It's not so, not so easy to integrate over this region, but it's easy if you put the d theta outside. Then here x, you are going from zero to some number that reflects that x is less than or equal to L over two sine theta. Then the rest is mechanical integration that is not part of this class, but if you know how to do it, good for you. At the very end, you get this answer here. So you have an actually close form answer of this probability, which is very nice in my opinion. Okay, so you see that you can actually use this sort of um, probability methods, join density to find, to figure out this little puzzle known as Buffon's needle. And uh, there's a history of this in the book, which you, you might want to read. So there's, there are many generalizations on this uh, in Wikipedia as well. You can read. Okay, Valencia and friends, any other questions? This is not so straightforward because now this is a strange region and this is a strange uh, event that we are integrating over. It's not a rectangular thing. So we have to take care. Actually, what's the purpose of this? The purpose of this Valencia is to illustrate to you the use of the joint PDF. And it is to illustrate that actually what we have learned can be used to solve some problems. It's not a real world problem, I understand, but it's to, it's to illustrate to you that what you have learned can be used for some non-trivial problem. Uh, maybe there's no use of this in real life. I, I have to admit, okay. <laughs> I don't, I don't think this can save the world, but some people may be intrigued like me. Okay, so let me go on to some other topics because we have talked about the joint PDF. Once we talk about the joint PDF, we can talk about the joint CDF. Remember this stands for cumulative distribution function. And it's a very nice object because it unifies the presentation of discrete and continuous random variables. Now, discrete random variable, if we are discrete, just for the sake of David, right? Just to remind you, when we are talking about discrete random variables, we talk about probability mass functions. When we have continuous random variables, we talk about the probability density function. But we cannot talk about probability density function for discrete random variables. That doesn't make any sense. We cannot talk about probability mass functions for continuous random variables. That makes no sense. But we can talk about CDF, for both discrete and continuous random variables. So that unifies, okay? And just to remind you, the cumulative distribution function of two random variables, x, y pair, is given by this symbol f, x, y, little x, little y. And that is basically the accumulation of all probabilities from the left to the right. Okay, that is the definition. And more precisely, this is minus integration from minus infinity to y, minus infinity to x, f, x, y, s, t, d, s, d, t. Okay? Yeah. So you remember for the univariate case, univariate means one variable, bivariate means two variables, okay? For the univariate case, you can recover the PDF from the CDF by differentiation. Here you can get the same thing. You can recover the PDF from the CDF also by differentiation. So it holds that, that means it's true, we can prove this, but I'm not gonna do it. It holds that 
the PDF XY can be recovered from the CDF through partial differentiation. D squared by DX DY, the CDF here. Okay, so this is a direct analog of the case uh, of, for the case of um, univariate random variables. Here now we're dealing with bivariate. Okay, so let me provide a simple example to illustrate these definitions. Okay, so now let's consider XY to be uniformly distributed on the unit square. So that means that the PDF looks like this. The PDF looks like this. I'm not going to draw three-dimensional. I'm just going to draw two-dimensional. So from zero to one, the so one here, this X, this Y. And in this region here, the PDF is uniform. So you have to think out of the box, literally, because now you have to think that there is a surface that is jutting out from this uh, blue plane. And FXY, XY is equal to some constant in the blue part. So when XY is in the square, so this is a square, and XY is not in the square. So when XY is not in the square, you get zero. So Valencia, can you tell me what is this number here? Anyone who wants to help our friend? What is this number in question mark? One. Very good. So you understand, okay, that the volume must be equal to one. So the, the base here is equal to one. So one times what is equal to one? One times one is equal to one. So the height must be one. So this is the PDF, a very nice PDF. So now we can e easily evaluate the CDF, which is f of xy, xy. So we have that particular formula, which is this, okay? And we can just plug it in. But now the density is particularly simple, all right? It's particularly simple, but we know that, in fact, before we do anything, let us try to reduce the range because we don't have to go from minus infinity to y. We just have to go from zero to y since the density is zero outside this region. But once we have this, Right, for x, y, here I take x, y to be inside the square. Okay, then this becomes one ds dt. Okay, but now the inter inner integration here is from zero to x of one ds. You recover x exactly. Okay, but now x is a constant with respect to the integrand. If we respect to the, the integration here, so you, here you recover x, y. Okay, so the point I want to make here is that the joint cumulative distribution function is equal to x, y when x and y belong to the square. That means like this, okay? So this is one way to recover the cumulative distribution function. And you see that uh, if I think, if I want to recover the density, the probability density function, then I do a double integration, double differentiation here. Now, if you differentiate this xy, okay, so you take xy, you differentiate this, then you get, you can just split this, right? d by dy of y, but both are one, so you recover one, but only when xy belong to the square. Okay, so you see that you can toggle neatly between the PDF and the CDF, right? Uh, any questions? So the CDF is very nice because it allows us to unify the treatment of discrete and continuous random variables. Otherwise, it's very messy. Okay. Any questions from uh, the Zoom people? Any questions from the physical audience? Not, uh, let me talk about a few statistics that uh, we care about, namely the expectation. Okay, so suppose we have continuous random variables, x and y are continuous uh, random variables. So we have a pair of them uh, with density, probability density function given by fxy as usual. Now, if we let gxy 
be a function of the random variables x, y. So every time there is an x and y, you put it into the function g, it gives you a particular real number. Okay, so that is a function. Then we have created a new object, a new random variable, which I can give you a name called z. So z is equal to g, x, y. So this brand new random variable has its own expectation and variance. So one way to compute the expectation of Z is to first figure out its probability density function. So you can try to figure out its probability density function and perform this integration. All right, this is the definition of the expectation. But you need to use X, Y, pass it to G to figure out this probability density function. This is usually very, very cumbersome. A more refined way is to actually show that, is to actually realize that you can perform this calculation by sidestepping having to know the probability density function of G. We can just use the probability density function of X and Y as follows. And this is in direct analogy to what we have done for the discrete case, okay? So there's nothing surprising here. There's nothing surprising. So this is uh, another way to say expectation value of G, X, Y. We can just plug the G. So this G here is exactly the same as the G inside here. Now, the fact that this and these, these two are the same is actually not so trivial, but we, we have proved it once. I'm not going to do it again. We have proved this once for the discrete case and the proof for the continuous case is of course, completely analogous. Now, there are some functions that are more important than others, e.g. this affine function, say ax plus by plus c. This is an affine function. Affine function. Okay. So in this case here, the expectation of this particular nice affine function can be shown to be a times the expectation value of x plus B times the expectation value of Y plus C. So this means that expectation, as you can imagine, is linear. It's a linear operator. Okay? So that's very nice. That's very natural. We cannot say the same about variance. It's not true. Okay? It's a bit complicated. If we want to apply the variance to this, it's a bit complicated. It's certainly not true that this is the case. All right? unless there are some very, very special conditions. So are there any questions on these things? Are there any questions here? Okay, if not in the last few minutes of this one hour lecture, I would like to talk about conditioning, which is a rather difficult concept, all right? And then we will try to do some examples. Conditioning a random variable on an event. We have certainly done this for the discrete case. So now what we are doing is for the continuous case. So we are going to let A be, a, be an event with positive probability. Be an event with positive probability. That means that the probability of the event A is bigger than zero, okay? So this is not a random variable, it's only an event. Remember that I usually use X, Y, Z for random variables. Events are usually A, B, C, okay? So we can talk now about the, prob the conditional probability that a certain random variable takes on the value, takes on a certain value in B, conditioned on the event A, all right? So by base rule, this is nothing but probability that X is in B intersect with A divided by the probability of A. This is exactly what we mean by conditional probability. Okay, so we can now define the conditional PDF probability density function of a random variable X given an event A, all right? the conditional PDF of X given event A, which we denote 
by f of x given a is the function, it's a non-negative function that satisfies the following probability that x belongs to b given a, it is integral over b of f of x given a x dx. Okay, so now if a is the full set, if a is the is the set, is the event with probability equals to one, that means it's the full set. Then this is basically this definition basically reduces to that of the usual PDF, not the conditional PDF. Okay. So the conditional PDF is written as follows. We are conditioning on a particular event. But now on the left-hand side, we condition on the event. On the right-hand side, we condition on this event as well. So that's fine. Okay. So notice uh, this is exactly what I said. Okay. Now, if in fact B is equal to R, okay, that means that, uh, that, means that uh, X takes on any value, then you notice that this is the following x in b given a is equal to minus infinity to infinity f of x given a x dx. This must be equal to one. So what this is telling us is that i.e. f of x given a x is a legitimate, legitimate PDF. By itself. Okay. So condition on any event, if I look at f of x given a, that itself is a legitimate PDF, okay? So what is this PDF that we are concerned with, all right? What is this PDF? So um, let's consider the following uh, case, all right? If we condition on an event of the form x belonging to C, so that is our event A, right? So here we are always conditioning on this particular event. All right. So someone told us that the random variable landed in a particular set C. Okay. Then what we have is the following, right? This is probability of x belonging to b condition on x in c because that is our event a this is our event a okay so now we can uh, again apply base rule to see that this is x in b intersect c because now the numerator is well x in b and x in c so we can rewrite that as follows divided by the denominator which is probability x belonging to c okay but this can be rewritten in the following way. Okay, this is nothing but the integral over B intersect C of F of X of X divided by, the bottom is a constant, probability X in C of DX. Okay. So now by comparing, by comparing this equation here, this is called equation one, and we can call this equation two, right? By conditioning, by, co by comparing, I mean, one and two. So we find that the conditional probability density function of X conditioned on the event that X belongs to C is given by the following. Fx over probability X belonging to C if X belongs to C and zero otherwise. Okay. Now, this all sounds a bit complicated, so I have to illustrate this using some examples. The first time I learned this is also complicated. All right, so, but the message is the following before I do the examples, okay? Conditioning, the conditional PDF has the same shape as the original PDF, as the unconditional or the original PDF, okay? in the conditioning set C. And zero outside. And zero outside C. 
Okay. So let us look at some particular examples, right? Let's consider this simple example where our original PDF is uniform between zero and one. So, so here's our FSX and we are uniform from zero to one. And this must be one, of course. So there's our random variable. And now the, my question to you, uh, this is not in the book, is the following. Now, what is the, con find the conditional PDF of X conditioned on X belonging to, um, let's say, condition on the event that X is between zero and half. So someone told us that the realization of X is between zero and half. I know for sure that X is between zero and half even though X can be between zero and one. So I, I actually run the experiment, but David told me that in fact, X is some number between zero and half. How does that bias my belief about the distribution of X, the probability density function of X? So David told me that he actually observed the outcome and the outcome is between zero and half here. He told me that, okay? So how does that alter my belief of X upon hearing this message? Okay, so now, in fact, well, we can just do the following, right? This is our original de uh, density, all right? Our new density looks like this, all right? It will still be uniform on zero to half, except that it will be much taller. It will be two times as tall. So this is our density f of x given what David told us that x is between zero and half. So here I'm writing in the interval format of x. Now, the conditional PDF or PDF, the conditional PDF is a legitimate PDF. So the conditional PDF must also integrate to one underneath here. The, you need to check that this area is one. I'm taking into account what David told me that X is between zero and half. So X only appears here. I want to respect David's opinion to put zero probability mass on there. Okay, but David only told me that X is between zero and half. So that does not bias my belief about my, the uniformity of X here. So this is also uniform, but the conditional PDF must be a legitimate PDF. So the area underneath must still be maintained to be one. And the only way this can happen is if the height here is two. Understand? So I need to rescale. Okay. And this actually respects this formula here. Because what did David told me? David told me this event here. What is the probability of this event? The probability that X is between zero and half is exactly equal to half is the area here. The area here is half, right? So now, if I'm interested in this particular uh, density, I will take the original density fx of x divided by the probability that x is between zero and half. Only when x is between zero and half and zero otherwise. But this formula here exactly reduces to the following. Okay, this is exactly equal to because the bottom, the denominator, the denominator is equal to half as we computed. So this is two fx of x. But two times fx of x is exactly equal to two because fx of x in that interval is exactly equal to one. So this is two, which is reflected in this line here. Is that clear? Is that uh, clear? I know this is a bit difficult. When I first encountered this, it's also a bit difficult. So as you can tell here, no matter what is the shape of my original PDF, if I constrain myself to a particular region, outside that region, I have zero density. Okay, outside, I have zero mass. But in that particular region in which I know that the random variable exists, okay, then it has the same shape, flat, but it's taller. It's taller by how much? is taller by the reciprocal of the probability that X lands in that region. 
And the reason for this is that this is a bona fide probability density function. And so it must integrate to one. Is that clear? I don't want to do any other thing today. This is a good point to stop. My professor used to tell me, in the last five minutes, do not start a new proof. Of course, this is not a proof class. But in the last five minutes, do not start a new concept. So this is the last concept I want to leave you with. In the next lecture, we will start with another example. If I start with another example now, I cannot finish it. And I have to rush. There is no need to rush. And Oliver is telling me that uh, he is not so optimistic. <laughs> but don't worry. We will be fine. Okay? So this is where I want to stop today. And I'll see you at the tutorial on Thursday. All right? Take care and see you. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 Take care. Hang on, hang on.